welcome and thank you all for coming and being with me today. I'm very grateful to have your attention on what is the feast day uh, in the church's calendar of St. Patrick. You know, one of the things that we first want to mention is that when we think of feast days, uh, we always want to celebrate birthdays. And, you know, if you ask somebody, we think of President's Day, for instance, or Martin Luther King's uh, holiday, uh, we celebrate those on the, on the anniversary of their births. Uh, in the church, we celebrate people's anniversaries of their birth into heaven. So we remember them on their death day. Uh, and so today we would mark that. For instance, I mentioned Dr. King. We celebrate in January uh, the civic holiday of Martin Luther King's birthday in the church as a, a modern saint. We remember him on April the 4th, the date of his, uh, his assassination. So it kind of gives you this idea of already we're going into some place where there's two worlds, uh, the world of the sacred and the world of the secular. And when we talk about St. Patrick, we're going to talk about not only who he is as a man, but who he was to the Irish. And through him, uh, and a thread that I think we can see, his introduction of Christian Catholicism has not only a religious overtone and impact, but also has a secular overtone and impact. Part of the reason that I bring this to this particular conversation is because I think in this and in other ways, I wear two hats. On the one hand, I'm obviously a priest. I've got all the gear. Uh, but I'm also, uh, I took a degree in history prior to going to seminary. So I'm also bringing to the table an historian's interest and perspective on things. And I hope with those two, I would hasten to say amicable, but nonetheless extremes, two different agendas and perspectives, then I hope that we'll be able to bring into our conversations about St. Patrick, something that will look at those two uh, complementary perspectives on him as both man and saint. Now, in this title, I talk about the difference between hagiography to history, and I'll say more about those two terms, but just to give quick definitions, hagiography is the, the story of saints, the telling of the story of saints, and then there's history, which we think of as something different. It's the telling of things as they occurred and their impact and their understandings of things, uh, both retrospectively as well as in their own times. And so when we look at this, we're going to be seeing two different perspectives as well, looking at the person of St. Patrick um, and how Britain, a Britain, a man from the other islands, uh, from Scotland, uh, changed Ireland to a profound place in world history and influence. And as you'll see, you know, we, we as a nation are going to really see how far the Irish are deeply entwined inside our culture. Now, I want to just share one little piece of humor from this first picture. Uh, that you're seeing here, this statue. Um, one of my children saw this and asked immediately, are those two beer cans in between St. Patrick's feet in the statue? And the short answer is they're not. I mean, I had to look myself at first because I didn't even notice them. They're votive candles, which is to say they're candles given as an offering and reverence to St. Patrick. So when you see those there, uh, they're actually somebody recognizing and honoring his, his saintly stature and importance to the people of Ireland. I want to kind of lay the groundwork here for us to talk about Ireland as a nation. Um, ancient Ireland is very ancient. There are human evidences going back as much as 33,000 years on Ireland. You know, we can begin to theorize about how they traveled there. You know, this is uh, antecedent to things like land bridges and things of that sort. So, it's interesting for us, you know, ice bridges. So it's anything for us to look at, but this firm foundations of a prehistoric civilization dating back as much as 13,000 years ago, we see artifacts from there and we can begin to see settlements, you know, so it's, it's not just sort of tribal movements or begins to be real civilizations. Um, it is, has something very profoundly in concert with Native Americans uh, in terms of a civilization. They were strictly an oral communication civilization. So we have no written histories. You know, there's no Rosetta Stone for us to unlock some ancient writings of, the, uh, of our friends, the Irish, because what we have from our first written histories actually come from Greek and Roman writers coming around the beginning of what we would call the Common Era, or you know, AD, as we turn over from BC to AD. Um, Gaelic Ireland's it, earliest cultures existed both independent of and influenced by outside cultures and societies. Almost always the ancient uh, and present Ireland where it was a nation of shipbuilders and seafarers. So they had their sort of isolated incidents in which they 
They were themselves on their own place. They, they largely avoided some of the worst of the, of the things like the, uh, the Viking raids and things of that sort. But they were, on the other hand, themselves going out and finding and gathering things to bring in. Uh, this beautiful artifact we see here uh, of a tool of a dual-sided animal kind of gives you this notion of them having some influences. The next slide really impacts that. This is an Irish relic from the prehistory, but it carries on strong Aegean influences uh, and probably in and of itself may have even come from the Greek Isles. You can see things that you may recognize if you're familiar with some of the early Greek creations. Uh, so they, they had this opportunity to bring things into their culture. Uh, prior to Patrick, it's kind of hard to track uh, really who and what they did because it was all oral. Um, you know, Connor and I sometimes chit chat about, about uh, paganism and some pagan rituals. The hardest thing about us being able to track like the Druids of both Britain and Ireland is to miss the reality that a lot of this is purely conjecture. There was such a slaughter of them that occurred, especially in the, in the realm of, of, of the English uh, and, and Scottish areas. But what we also see is there's no written records for us to be able to reestablish and identify what their actual practices were. A lot of them are conjecture from some relics and some indications and descriptions of the Romans and Greeks. But it, it, so much of it comes from a lot of 19th century English people that were trying to figure out if they could come to some conclusions, a lot of conjecture. But prior to the Norman invasions of the 12th century, the political system was encompassed. And I love this. It's sort of a loose federation of kings that were titularly headed by a high king. And the high king's main role was to act as an arbiter and the final word over all of the individual tribal kings that, that encompassed all of Ireland. And, and this idea of a tribal system that could be both fractious but unified by the rulings of a high king, this is gonna play really importantly inside how Patrick is going to accomplish his mission in Ireland. To say a little bit about their culture and especially their religion. Um, pre, prior to the coming of, of Christianity, it was polytheistic and very mythologically based. And again, we have only the writings of later monks, Christian monks, who brought their writing to try and record what we have uh, taken from uh, ancient Irish culture and religion. And, and we have to take that with a grain of salt, uh, not because they're being necessarily malicious, but they're obviously bringing their outside perspectives. And a lot of it's going to be critical. They're going to be looking at the, the mythology, if you will, uh, of the ancient Irish. You know, and I, I always want to draw people when we start talking about mythology to Joseph Campbell, who's probably one of the greatest writers having to do anything with sort of mythology. He was, he was sort of the, the great grandfather of all knowledge, and he did these wonderful uh, series uh, on PBS that I always recommend as well. But Joseph Campbell's our great granddaddy of knowledge about mythology and ancient, uh, ancient stories and lore. Um, there are strong parallels between Irish and other Northern European sources. So we can see a lot of crossover with, say, the Norse. Now, I just mentioned Joseph Campbell. He would say it's, it's as much having to do with cross-pollinization as also their own sort of validity of ancient mythology. We see these parallels in them, not necessarily because they read something out of the Norse book and said, well, we're going to make that our story. A lot of what happened in these Northern European nations were these attempts to describe both the natural and the supernatural worlds. And, and they use the same storylines because it's the ones that were the most applicable. Joseph Campbell would say this is the validation of mythology because it speaks of the human condition in areas, you know, both isolated and universal. So in that sense, you know, this early sense of the, the prehistory of Ireland is something that's going to stay with them because it's a worldview. It's something that they see of themselves. And it was also animist, which is to say very broadly that they believed that all aspects of the natural world contain some sort of sentient spirit that you could both communicate with and in some instance be at odds with or in harmony with. Uh, everything from the sun all the way down to your door hinges. There would be something inside of those things that was both engageable with and something that you would also have perhaps even to make reverence to if you wanted it to work well. Um, it was very pastoral and very seasonal. It was tied to the changing of the seasons, the coming of winter or spring, and, and they did believe strongly in an afterlife. I wish I had a photograph of this. I couldn't find one in time. 
But one of the most interesting things about their sense of an afterlife and the ancient philosophies meshed wonderfully with Christianity. Um, there is evidence in the ancient tombs of Ireland uh, that it was also the place that people went to birth their children. Uh, literally, there were crude stirrups, if you will, that a woman would be able to position herself to give birth in the very place that their dead were laying. Um, if you wanted to read something more about the idea of the origins of religion and, and prehistory and in human perceptions, I, I always like to mention Rudolf Otto and his works. Uh, he's someone that really begins to ask, he talks about the big questions, and I tend to gravitate towards that. Where did I come from and where do I go? And these are the things that we see being answered inside both the Gaelic religion and Christianity. Um, as I said earlier, they're older and less contaminated from foreign materials than many of their neighbors. Being a little bit out there in the in, past the Irish Sea gives them a little bit more of an identity that they're able to preserve some isolation. Uh, most of what survives we have from epic poems and tales uh, that, that are sort of tangential to maybe what their overall culture was doing, but it does give us some insights. One of my favorite anecdotes has to do with Celtic Christianity, and I want to say this very briefly ahead of introducing that. Um, because it was isolated from the worst deprivations of Viking raiders, uh, the world didn't seem so evil to the, uh, to the Celtic Irish. So it's an interesting perspective that when the Irish, uh, in Anglo-Saxon and English Christian tradition, and certainly in the continental Christian tradition, the idea of blessing something like making holy water, you would bless water because you had to drive the evil out of it. You had to get Satan out of the water. Uh, the Celts never thought the water needed to be exercised. The Celts thought that the that water was made by God and was holy to begin with. So there's sort of a, an optimism that comes from having had a longer sense of peace uh, until the English came and ruined it all. Uh, <laughs> but they felt as if they had a little more of a happy view in their worldview. Um, and given the possible modifications from the monks, you know, we can still look at those writings and find something that helps us to be able to see and understand the Irish world, even though we have no written records of their own. So here's Patrick. Patrick the man is what I want to start with, because we're going to be looking at him both biographically, which is very, very limited, and hagiographically. How are we going to look at him and how he is seen as a saint and a member, not just as a member of the Church of Ireland, but in his place in the Christian story, which is what ultimately hagiography wants to do. We can say about him, first of all, is that, you know, we mostly know what we have from his own perspective and answers. He, re he left two written texts for us. The one we would probably think of today is the Confessions. It's probably better translated as the Declaration, uh, Confessio being the, the, the Latin. And there's another one that was a letter to soldiers of Coraticus, and this was an unfortunate letter of remonstrance against these guys, uh, because they had apparently gone in and slaughtered all the men uh, in a village and took the women and children into slavery. So he wrote them a, a sort of a chastising letter to amend their ways so they were going to get into trouble with them. Um, in these, he gives sort of a brief account of his life and his missions, so we can begin to sort of understand a little bit more about who he was as a man. Uh, at least, again, from his own self-reporting. Um, it's interesting that most of the quoted and storied details of his life are from those hagiographic sources. They lack the objective evaluation of truth because their goal is not to tell a biography of a man, per se, but to put him into the overall narrative of the Christian world in which he is a special example. And so in that sense, we can begin to see this deviation between the two. Let me just say a little bit more about hagiography. I like this word, hagia, from the Greek meaning uh, of holy or of a saint, and graphy meaning to process of writing or recording. It's a writing about a saint. I think it's important, not a man, not the man inside of the saint, but about that saint in his place of where it is. Now, I don't want to say as an historian that these are completely useless. Hagiography is just about a pejorative term. Most historians will look at hagiography and go, oh my God, you know, because it's like we're going to see something here where suddenly somebody lives for 900 years and he's able to talk to animals. Um, and what we can do, on the other hand, is we can begin to glean out from those very useful facts if we're willing to come at them with a good dose of, of, of objectivity and a little bit of skepticism. Uh, Christian hagiographies consist of Vita, biographies, lives, 
Uh, and that's an important term. A life is actually something that the ancient Romans used to do. Vitas were something that, that talked more about the impact and the, uh, the, the persona of someone rather than trying to make some sort of accurate description of who they were walking around uh, occasionally needing to use the bathroom. I mean, this was not something that they're supposed to do. And so in this sense, many of these were very interested in the miracles that they were reported to have done and some things having to do with the spectacular natures of their death. This stone in this image is interesting to look at. This is believed to be the resting place of Patrick. Now it's unfortunately uh, eroded because what we see there is P-A-T-R-I and dangles off. The truth is his real name would not have been Patrick. That's the anglicized version of that. I'm English, so having Patrick on my name encompasses that, ang that anglicized version of the, the Latin, which is Patricit, Patricius, Patricius. The, uh, uh, the Gaelic would have called him Pedric, with a D instead of a P, and a, and a, and a sort of a diphthong there, of Pedric, as opposed to Patrick or even anything else. He was from a noble family, as his name implies. The word means patrician or a noble person. Um, as I've already hinted already, he was not an Irishman by birth. He was a Briton. He came from the west coast of Scotland and was strictly of Roman uh, British descent. His name, his characteristics, his family reportings of having been, you know, sort of upper class civil servants uh, really does identifying as somebody that would belong to the Roman structure of ancient Britain. Um, he tells us in his own story that he was kidnapped by raiders, probably Irish pirates bent on booty and capturing slaves somewhere in the late fourth century and was sold as slave on an island somewhere around his 16th birthday. So that relatively young age on the cusp of manhood really, probably you know, able to perhaps marry, but not quite yet. And so it is that he comes to Ireland. And for in Ireland, we hear very briefly described that he spends six years there until he's able to escape and return home uh, from Britain, uh, to Britain rather. And then uh, it's kind of an interesting story. He gets on a trading ship and he essentially smuggles himself out. Uh, and as we see here is this reputed burial date. Now, this is interesting. And you know, I told you that he was 16, somewhere in the latter uh latter fourth century, so the 300, 380, 390 times. Um, and then earlier we see that he has died uh, maybe 493. Uh, we begin to see the beginnings of hagiography. Did he really, really live that long? So then there's Patrick the legend. As I just said, he didn't live for 120 years. There's even some historians which begin to suggest that maybe there were two Patricks, two Patricks. And so that the time span we encompass may have been more than one person. Um, but he did remarkably escape from Ireland. This is more legend than hagiography. He probably lived his entire life naked. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you may know that the servant class of the, uh, the house elves become uh, freed when you give them clothes. Uh, a slave in ancient Ireland was naked and to be clothed was a sign of being a freedman. And so it was that he would have lived for six years pretty much naked. Maybe he would rack himself in something to keep himself warm, but he was not a clothed person. And so he would have had to have left his post to run away. And to do that almost undoubtedly would have made him uh, a, a, under a death sentence, being caught on sight. He wouldn't simply be brought back and put back into servitude and beaten or something like that. He'd be killed on sight. But then we see that legend takes on a dimension of the divine and the miraculous. We dig into hagiography. Now this port, this is one of the few St. Patrick's Day kitsch that I'm gonna put up there in that image. This is an Irish wolfhound, unfortunately dressed as poor dog's dignity is being savaged by this picture. But I want us to understand that the only companion he had, he was probably out in the middle of nowhere tending sheep, that he would have had a wolfhound to drive off any sort of animals or to alert him to danger. Um, and this Irish wolfhound was his only friend. And so it was that he has a dream one night where this hound, you hear the hagiography coming up, is that in he, this was actually an angel. Now, was it that it represented an angel coming to communicate with him? Or was it that the poor hound was always an angel? He didn't know, but this is the story. His angel comes to him in the form of his Irish wolfhound companion and tells him it's time for him to go and escape. So he does flee. He finds himself on the Irish coast 
where he comes up to a ship that ironically is covered from stem to stern with Irish wolfhounds that are being shipped out for sale in Gaul and France. And he wants to get on board. He begs them to accept him. They don't want to because they know that he's a runaway slave. But what happens is, is they come to realize that this unruly band of Irish wolfhounds that are all barking and striping and threatening the sailors become strangely peaceful and placid whenever Francis is on board. So they decide to take him along because they figure he can train these dogs. And at the very least, they'll, they'll sit still on the voyage to Gaul. Well, as it is, they have a shipwreck. And as the hagiography tells us, they initially, uh, with no goods and no food on the barren areas of, of the north of France, uh, they begin to taunt him, the crew, saying, hey, why don't you pray to your God and get us some help? Well, the way the story goes, Patrick, Patrick prayed all night, and in the morning, a herd of wild pigs suddenly appeared coming out of the forest. And interestingly, then the, the dogs that they had that he had trained became useful. They went out there and began to uh, bring, well, to kill the pigs. And they were able to then eat, and the, apparently the entire crew was so convinced that they converted to Christianity. What we hear inside this hagiography is this idea of where does Francis come in? Um, people that would otherwise be discounted can prove the validity of God, and then, and then they can further bring about redemption and feed people and, and bring them what they need, and also, ultimately, they convert. So very early on, we begin to see that he's already beginning to have an impact. Now, just to say again, hagiography is not about biography. It is not a historical account of a life. The purpose is both inspirational and soteriological, which is a wonderful theological term, meaning it has to do with helping people to get saved. We want to inspire people to say, golly, you know, this guy's done something really spectacular. I want to be like him. It is, makes people to be aspired to do something both personally, but also in their society and in the world, to measure up to the ideals of this person. It tends to lack ordinary details. You know, very rarely will it come back and say, you know, when he was a little boy, he studied here. And that's sort of hagiography is more about creating a persona. Uh, and by a persona, I mean that by the Greek word, which means something that stands to represent an identity, something more than simply, uh, you know, a, a, a guy with a particular history. Um, it does include some details, but not a lot. It, it, it tends to glorify him, and it doesn't really focus on his sins, his shortcomings, unless it's how profoundly he was converted in them. Now, the question is, is this propaganda? Now, we've come to hate propaganda ever since the early part of the 20th century, especially with Nazi Germany and things of that sort. We come to look upon propaganda as being a lie, and in many chances, it can, chances it can be. But propaganda also can be what we might call somewhere else more flatteringly as optics or, uh, you know, creating a mission or an image or a, a brand and an identity that we're trying to promote. So in a sense, this is what we see. And from almost a business perspective, you're trying to inspire people to want to attach to something. And in that sense, there's truth in it, but truth told in a way that brings you along with it. I mentioned one more book here, just on the side, and I hope that this will inspire people to get it. Sorry for the fuzzy picture. Um, there's a secular version. This Jacob Needleman is, is amongst other things, a uh, fabulous philosopher of history, uh, which is to say that he looks at history, not just from an historian's perspective, but asks the questions, what is it in and of itself? What do we do when we write and study history? And he wrote this really tremendous book, The American Soul, that I did as a book study last Lent at my church. Because what he does is he looks at the American story, the American persons. You can see here everyone from Frederick Douglass, George Washington, but also Native Americans and Abraham Lincoln, and looks at these people and says, you know, do we want to simply think of them as these messed up, conflicted, mixed bag of tricks that human beings are? Or do we as Americans find in creating a history that has its own kind of hagiography? that makes us better people, even as we know we're gonna be constantly struggling with our own personal good and evil natures and our country's good and evil natures. And so the notion is, is do, we, do we find ourselves wanting to become something about our better angels, uh, or do we simply celebrate and look at their, their sins and their warts and have them revealed so they can be canceled out and then we left with no one to look to? So in that sense, I kind of want us to think of it that way. 
Now to think about Patrick again, be back on our subject for today, Patrick returns to Ireland. Um, while he was a slave, he actually talks about hardship in a way that's very important. You know, at first he's, as any of us would be, very sad to be in this terrible position. And he says, though, I didn't know God back then, but as he says here, but in a strange land, the Lord opened my unbelieving eyes and I was converted. If he had been back home in the luxury of home, he may not have been confronted with the need to rely upon God. And so he found himself clinging uh, to a dog and God. And so he saw his kidnapping, his homesickness as an opportunity to know God better. And so it changed his mind about hardship. And so one of the great sort of pinnacles of Patrick is the idea that even in hardship, we can find good things. He says here, anything that happens to me, whether pleasant or distasteful, I ought to accept with serenity, because even the bad things can do good things for me. And so it is that Patrick, coming back to from, from, uh, being in, 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 in Britain again, uh, he, it's an important conversion for him. And so, you know, so he finds himself, he's now in this called back to this land of his exile. Uh, he wants to come back because, and he says it's not his normal way of doing things. This is a great quote. Uh, how many of us would not utterly agree with him? It is not in my nature to show divine mercy towards the very ones who once enslaved me. Patrick says, you know, it's just not my thing to go home and let uh, myself be given over to these people that treated me so poorly for six years. My dragged me out of my home. I'm a family and everything. But in a dream, he's called to do this. He's already been ordained. He's going to become a priest. He actually receives a papal commission to go and become the apostle, the bishop to the Irish. And that word apostle doesn't just mean that he wears a special vestment, a special office. That word from the Greek apostolos means to be sent. So he's going to be sent somewhere on behalf of the church. And where he's going to be sent is back to Ireland. Now, as I said, this is not like Ireland has lived in a vacuum. It's not totally, they, they trade, they do some piracy with between Europe and even as far away as Egypt. So Christianity has likely not unknown in Ireland prior to Patrick's coming. And indeed, during the time that Patrick was training to go to Ireland, Pope Celestine sent a bishop by the name of Palladius. Uh, Palladius only lasted one year, though, God bless him. So he is the first bishop to Ireland, soon to be uh, coming along with Patrick, who trained for 21 years. So he wasn't going to be very quick coming himself, but he eventually does go back to Ireland in order to, be, to begin this mission. Now, I want to tell you that it's true that he did convert Ireland, but it's not that he went door to door. And, you know, like, like some uh, you know, pre-modern uh, pre time Mormon missionary knocking on the door and wanting to talk to them about Jesus Christ. Um, he was strategic and he was fortunate. What he did was he used political influence. And remember, I told you this was a nation made up of individual kingdoms underneath a high king who really didn't exercise a totally monarchical role over all the affairs of each of those, uh, those various kingships, but he did have an arbitration and authority to bind them together. So there was a pivotal event that is thought of as in the spring of 433. There's this moment in which the Druids were doing something, and Patrick comes along and begins to do something else. He begins to celebrate Easter. It may not have even been Easter, but he does some things. He bakes a new fire, which we do as a ritual of the Easter vigil as Christians, and we, we light a new candle. And he's getting attention, and he's even drawing the attention of the high king. Uh, and as it goes along, they want to stop him. They tell the high king, get rid of this guy. But they seemingly miraculously can't put his fire out. They can't extinguish the flame of the Paschal candle, which is symbolic of Jesus' resurrection and our eternal life inside the church's various uh, instruments and, and, and vessels. And so it was that this impressed the king enough that he listened to what Patrick had to say, and he became converted. So it was that he got baptized, as we see here in this image. And with him, it was convinced that this was what he wanted to do for the whole nation. Is that we want to bring everyone over to this. And so it was that we see that Patrick, by working into the very tip top, by going to the high king, he was able to influence how to go forward with this all the way down throughout all of Ireland because of his authority as an arbiter to settle decisions on what people would do in a unified nation, even though he wasn't necessarily the king of everyone. 
Now, okay, I hope you'll recognize this picture. If you're of a certain age, you'll recognize that old TV commercial uh, that came out first with, uh, with Charlie Brown Christmas when it premiered in the 1960s. It's the Coca-Cola commercial, I want to teach the world to sing, okay? Now, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how Patrick did things in Ireland because he does something that we recognize today in business and in society as being powerful tools in bringing about a mass movement and bringing people over to a perspective and, a, and to an agreement with a, an idea and a movement. Syncretism, synergy, and branding. Now, these don't sound like things that Christians would do, but I can tell you as someone who studied in a seminary, we are taught a thing called missiology, which is the study of mission work. And in it, we're taught these sort of perspectives, how to bring people along, how to get one involved. And these are all things that we can see in everything from investments to church, you know, like I'm wearing a collar here now, all of the things that we do to try and capture and inspire people and to create a community and a movement using things that we also do in business. Syncretism is an interesting term. It means the combining of different forms and beliefs and practices. Is there something in belief practice in society A that we can adapt to society movement and belief B? Can we draw them together? Synergy is a little more easily recognized. It's this idea of a mutually advantageous conjunction or compatibility of distinct peoples or elements. You know, if you're a multinational company, is there a company in China doing something that you can team with another company in, that you own, say, in Belgium, that together can make something that you can sell in America? And, and they never would have met each other, but you're going to bring them together to make two things that are disparate, con connected, and cooperative to make something better than the individually they could do. And branding is this idea of promoting of a product or service by identifying it with a particular brand. And I use this image here, this idea of this is, you know, it's the 1960s, it's Christmas. And the message of Christmas, even for people that are not necessarily religious, is the idea of peace and goodwill towards all people. And in the 60s, with the rise of the counterculture, the rise of, of, of sort of racial justice going on in the civil rights movement, all the things that was sort of challenging America to reimagining re itself as being something that is about peace and harmony in the midst of the Vietnam War and all these things, that what Coke did by sponsoring a, what was ostensibly a, just a Christmas special, but actually a very religious Christmas special, Charlie Brown Christmas, is that it affiliated itself with something that has actually become a beloved family tradition for many of us. And likewise, it's a little jingle that shows people in different countries and people in different ethnicities and, and all of these things coming together and they're able to be at peace. And what are they doing? They're drinking a Coke. And, and it seems so banal and silly, but for many people, they identified with this and Coke got to be the soft drink of peace and harmony in, Christ, in Christmas, even if you weren't particularly Christian and open to it. So how did he do this? How did Patrick use these things? Well, there's a phrase we tend to use in the church that is the same thing as syncretism and synergy and, uh, um, and branding. It's called baptizing something. Now, this is important because what do you do in baptism is you're converting. That's the act of becoming a Christian. The ritual and the, the act, the sacrament of becoming a Christian, your enrollment into that covenant is the baptismal moment. And so it is when we say that we baptize something is we take something that wasn't Christian and we make it Christian. And so how is it that Pat, Patrick baptized paganism? Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about this, we can see encompassed in this picture. Uh, you see him standing here baptizing someone, and it's outside. If you look at the left-hand side, you're going to see that they're in a building here. But off in the distance, you look back there, you're going to see a stone circle that looks like Stonehenge back there. Patrick would use uh, Druidic sites and make them places where people would come for church services, for buildings, for meetings, and for places of baptism. Sacred rivers became the places that people were baptized. And so it was that a culture that had always gone to these places began to associate those places with being sites of religious practice in Christianity now, and not merely as simply sites that were previously associated with the religious practices of, say, um, uh, of pagans and druids. And, you know, one of the most iconic 
Irish Christian symbols shows this. Now, we all see, and again, the right-hand side here, you'll see the Celtic cross. I'm wearing one my beloved sister-in-law gave me today. And if you see it, you have this circle amongst this uh, this cross that we would all recognize as the, the symbol of Jesus' crucifixion and, and his death, which is so central to the Christian teaching. Um, that circle is not arbitrary. It's not there to hold up the arms. It can mean eternity, but it is also symbolic of an ancient circular uh, religious symbol, pagan uh, society. It's the sun. It's eternity. It's the cycle of the seasons that we've already talked about. And so it was something that was put up there to show the endless eternity of God, but it also showed um, this notion of a uh, of the uh, of the of the sun God as well as Christ. And so they had a symbol that they recognized and associated with it that was incorporated, baptized, renamed. No, no, it's not the sun God. It's it's the eternity and the and the unbroken nature of God. But they would all sit there and go, oh yeah, the circle. That's good. We know that. We belong to that. And as you can see here, this earlier symbol down in the, in the white, this, uh, this, this drawing, this is one of the symbols of the sun. It shows this sort of a tree fold, uh, which we're going to probably quite readily associate with the shamrock, which speaks to the Trinity. Now, one of the things that we know about St. Patrick that is so important is this idea of the shamrock. And this is the syncretism as well, because he needs to explain something that's difficult to understand, how it is that one God can be three persons. And so they already have this symbol of the divine that has these three components in a single knot, but then they can also pick up a shamrock out in the fields, and he can say, look, one leaf in three pieces. And it was something that they could both understand, visualize, and identify with, but also something that had its echoes in their more ancient religion. So they felt that they were not only uh, doing something new, but there was a continuity with their past. Kate Middleton, I know she's not Irish, but I wanted you to see that her going in for St. Patrick's Day uh, in an Irish festival in Northern Ireland, she's wearing shamrocks, both a nice, beautiful gold one that I'm sure did not come out of a field somewhere, but also a sprig of shamrocks. Now, it's interesting to note that this is not the symbol of Ireland. The Irish symbol is the bard's harp. You'll see the harp as the symbol, although it is very much symbolic of Ireland. It is not an Irish, it is not the Irish symbol. Uh, it goes back to this idea of a bardic people, that early notion of being a people that tell their stories and epics and tales and sagas. Now, this extends to almost a very frightening point. Now, there are churches in the world that are named St. Bridget's. Don't hate me for this. This is the historian just telling you some facts. St. Patrick makes great deal of St. Bridget of Kildare. There's a lot of association with St. Bridget of Kildare. Was there a St. Bridget? Probably. But here's where hagiography begins to really syncretize with the ancient world's religion because there was a goddess, Bridget. Now, it's very interesting. We have very little data at all about the life of St. Bridget of Kildare, but it's ironic that her patronal associations, like, you know, St. Francis is the patron saint of animals, she is patron saint of the same things that the pre-Christian goddess, Bridget, whose name means exalted one in the Gaelic, she was the patron goddess of wisdom, poetry, healing, protection, blacksmith, and domesticated animals, as is St. Bridget. So which is which? And when you look at this, you see a cross. You see this woven cross of St. Bridget. Well, it was also a pre-pagan symbol that denoted the four seasons. It's not necessarily a cross, you see. They're at actually odd angles for a cross, but you could baptize it and make it a cross, and people who were used to seeing this symbol would associate with something new while not destroying everything that was from their culture before. Little stories we have to dispense with. St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland? No, because chances are there were no snakes in Ireland to begin with. By the way, there's also some translations which would suggest that he drove the toads out of Ireland, but that's not nearly as interesting, nor does it fit in with hagiography, because snakes represent evil. The reality is the climate is probably too uh, inhospitable to snakes in general. 
So there are no straight snakes to be able to exist there. I'm sure that somebody, I don't understand the attraction, but I'm sure somebody has a boa constrictor pet in Ireland, but unlike South Florida, if it escapes, it will not last one Irish winter. So you're not likely to see snakes in the wild in Ireland. But as I said, the snakes may very well have meant that he drove out the ancient evil pagan beliefs and practices. So it has some sort of parallel when you think of them as snakes. Just to kill a few more myths about St. Patrick, his color is not green. St. Patrick's primary color is blue. Marian, which is to say the Virgin Mary, is blue. Uh, the green goes to Ireland and the fact that it is a very green country known as the Emerald Isle. Uh, on this day, many a person is going to be bending their elbow and drinking a lot today on St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick was in himself a teetotaler. He does not drink. He opposed it. Um, and just to kill two more legends about Ireland in general, leprechauns. They are a medieval, not an ancient, a medieval folk tale, something akin to sort of nasty fairies. And the pot of gold thing is far later than that. So I hate to break the bad news to you. There is no real ancient thread for these things. Uh, and, and the Lucky Charm cereal is something that Procter & Gamble did to sell stuff to kids. Now, I want to branch out from why St. Patrick matters. Now, it's interesting to learn about him, but one of the best books that I can point to about understanding the scope in which Irish civilization re-impacts the world is a book by Thomas Cahill that was a big bestseller uh, years past, How the Irish Saves Civilization a great book, a great easy read, sort of thing to put on your bedside table and you'll, you won't sleep for a few nights. It's very captivating. But K.O. believes that the Irish people played a prominent role because after the fall of the Western Empire, it was the Irish off there on their own little side out there, avoiding all the worst deprivations of barbarian invasions that were able to keep this Christianity that was seeded there by St. Patrick and was able to reintroduce it back to the Western European world. The Eastern Empire hovered out there and survived to the 11th century, but the reintroduction of Christianity comes from the Irish. He puts a lot of focus on this idea of St. Columba and the fact that he began to bring in these Hiberno-Scottish missions that would begin to come back out. And these holy men, sing, and I'm quoting here from Cahill, single-handedly refounded European civilization throughout the Western European continent. Bold words but he makes a really good case for it. Because you see, at the end of the Roman Empire, it really began is when the, when, the, when the Romans began to retreat out of Roman Britain. We can see this in the early fifth century. They're pulling up their tent stakes. And by AD 600, the Western Empire was a memory. It had been destroyed. The pagans, the Goths, the Visigoths, had sacked Rome, as we see here. And you know, Ireland was relatively isolated from all the worst of this. Now, these holy men, this is an interesting quick little discursus to introduce you to what these guys were like. What were these monks like? This on the left-hand side is Skellig Michael. I dreamed to go there one day. If you are a Star Wars fan, you will recognize that as where Luke Skywalker hid out. They actually filmed the scenes that were outside at Skellig Michael. It's a rock off the southwest coast of Ireland, which you can see in the distance behind it. And it was populated by monks. On the right-hand side, you can see their, their stone beehive-shaped huts that they lived in. Again, you'll recognize this if you've seen uh, that Star Wars film, the one with Kylo Ren and those guys, uh, that last trilogy that came out. Um, they were very ascetic. These are the sort of people that went off into nowhere to do their church thing. Uh, there was no soil on Skelly Michael. They brought it in on coracles, things that look like this. Now, you can't make it up to Skellig Michael except on certain days with modern ships because the water is so dangerous. These little baskets that they would go in, they would, they would load up with dirt and they would bring over a few bucketfuls at a time so they could grow their potatoes out there on Skellig Michael and survive and stay out there and worship and, 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 and pray out on that island broken off away from the rest of even Ireland, much less the, uh, the, the, the uh, European continent. But they also left these places, these Irish monks, and they became to be known what was called white martyrs. Now a red martyr is one who's killed violently for the faith. A white martyr 
puts his life on the line by, you see those little basket boats, getting in them and setting themselves adrift without rudder, oar, or sail to just see where the current brings them. And they would, many of them, I'm afraid, go out to sea and never be seen again. But others would find themselves traveling to Britain and the continent and be able to reintroduce Christianity. And the most important one of these is St. Columba. Now, his name, Kiln, means the dove of the church. Uh, quite a dove. He started a war over a copy of the Book of Psalms. He had copied somebody's psalm book. And when they demanded it back, saying, invoking the Irish principle that the calf goes with the cow, um, and he said, I want the book you copied as well as my book back, uh, Columbus started a war. Many people were killed, and the high king of, of Ireland sent him off into exile, and he had to be out of sight of Ireland until he saved as many souls as he killed. And so it was that he founded, uh, with some of his followers, a monastic community on the island of Iona on the west coast, off the west coast of Scotland. And from there began this base of operation that began to resettle Britain, Britain to begin with, with Christianity. Uh, on the west coast, down near Northumbria, is this place, Lindisfarne. And it was a, another one of these forts, these outposts. Um, in Northumbria, that where you began to have people like Aidan and Cuthbert and others who were reintroducing this in the very, very north of England and Northumbria. And from there, these new monastic communities began to spread Christianity back into England. Now, going along with this was the European uh, continent beginning to try and see if it can become expansionist. And there's a very sweet story about St. Augustine, who would later be St. Augustine of Canterbury, a bishop. And, and Pope Gregory, who was one day in the Roman slave markets, and they saw these beautiful blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, people, and, and, and he was so taken by them that, that the, uh, the Pope, uh, Gregory, said, who are these beautiful people? And he said, well, they are angles. And he said, no, not angles, angels. We must go save them. So he was going to send Augustine to repopulate Christianity, because at the time, you weren't allowed to have a Christian slave. So they were able to take these pagan Angles, Anglo-Saxons, and bring them over there and be able to take them and try and cultivate them into being uh, these, new, these new characters. And so it was that, that when Augustine finally went there, he found out there were already Christians there. A Kentish queen who was a Northumbrian princess had already been a Christian. There's, you know, there's, she has Hilda, who's run out to meet on the other side to meet Augustine coming aboard saying, don't worry, it's Christianity is still here. And in St. Uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say too much. I'm, I'm running over a little bit, but let me just say this much. The, the refounding of Christianity merged up from the bottom there. And it's at a place, a Celtic Irish descended monastery, uh, Whitby Abbey, that was actually run by a woman. Uh, the Irish and the Celts had mixed gender uh, monasteries that could be led by women as well as men. And St. Hilda was brought together to try and reconcile uh, the Celtic and the Roman Catholic uh, Christianities reconverting and converging in Britain. And ultimately, the Celts characteristically gave in. They said, sure, we'll do it your way. It was better for us to be friends and for us to have little details that we don't agree upon. And they all decided to do it the Roman way. It was also, Cahill says, these Irish uh, by first, I hear that we hear about a, a man that evangelized Britain, or probably Belgium. We hear about Alcuin. That's a name you should know if you're big in Carolingian divines, because it was it was uh, Charlemagne who was proud of the fact he could write his name by the time he died. Uh, Alcuin was this Celt who was able to bring the Irish script to introduce a written language into the Carolingian writings, the Carolingian minuscule. And even Irish monks Killian, who was able to bring the gospel into Germany. So you can see where this came from, this idea of the Irish reintroducing civilization. So in essence, what we have with St. Patrick is a real dividend. One guy from Romanish Britain, the you know, European side of things, that went over and seeded culture and religion so that it could be brought back after the tribulations of Visigoths and Goths and Vikings and all that sort that is so gutted European civilization. And I just want to close this up with a little bit of being able to look at the Irish in America, and that, more particularly the Irish in New York. St. Patrick's Day, 17th March, 
1601 was first celebrated in a Spanish colony. In St. Augustine down in Florida, their Irish vicar there, the person that was caring for them, was a man named Ricardo Artur or Richard Arthur. But this man was keeping his own patronal saint's feast day, and so they had a parade then. Up here in the Northeast, Irish who were serving in the, in the British Army first had a march in 1737, well before the American Revolution, in Boston and New York. So we begin to see the celebration of the Irish and their civilization. This is a fascinating map, just to peek at real here. Um, there are more Irish than there in America than there are in Ireland. The ratio is seven to one. There are seven times more Irish than there are Irish in Ireland in America. Mostly due to immigration having to do with the terrible potato famines of 1845 to 1852. This map, the darker the green, very symbolic color, the more thickly populated Irish are very much in the Southeast, but you can see sprinkled in a good line really across much of America. The Irish are everywhere. And you'll hear people of Irish descent refer to the Great Famine or the Great Hunger or simply the famine. And that's what brought people over in great droves. I wish I could tell you they were well received. This is a very offensive picture to an Irish person. But on the left, you have a caricature that was almost ubiquitous. Paddy, P-A-D-D-Y. Paddy looks pre-human simian. He, he, he's, he's, he's prehistoric. He's missing link. He's animalistic. He's barely human. He barely wears clothes. He wears a pot on his head. Um, this is the sort of caricature that was widespread. Um, it was prevalent. I'm ashamed to say my own grandmother, who was English, utterly abhorred Irish. When she found out that I had an Irish roommate in college, she actually was disgusted. And this was a prevalent reality in America. You may have heard of the, the sign, Irish need not apply. But there was also a suspicion about Catholicism. Now, if you look at the right-hand side, this caricature, this, this political cartoon is very nuanced. Coming out of the water looks like crocodiles. But if you look at very closely, they're bishops. And they're coming out of the water in the distance is St. Paul, uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome at the Vatican. So you see these brave looking Anglo-Saxon children who are backed up against a wall being threatened by these bishops wearing the pointed mitered hats that look very much like crocodile's jaws coming out of the water to threaten them with their evil tradition uh, of, of this, papist, <clears throat> this papist religion. And so it was that you'll even see going into the 1960s, the prevalence of anti-Irish and anti-Catholic belief. Over the left-hand side here, you see Billy Graham, perhaps, you know, for many of us will remember as being someone who is the epitome of Protestant evangelical Christian leadership in America, the friend of presidents. He was the president's pastor. He actually sent this very hypocritical, quite frankly, a lie assuring then Senator Jack, Jack Kennedy that he was not going to work against him or bring up the Catholic thing as he runs for. He said, yeah, I, I'm probably going to vote for Vice President Nixon, but, but don't think for a second that if you win, that you and I are going to get along fine and be friends. But the truth is that in 1860, probably 1960, he organized a meeting in Geneva, in Switzerland, of Protestant American evangelical ministers to get them involved in opposing the election of Jack Kennedy because of his Catholicism. That Catholic strain was problematic for them. But this goes way back. Here we are in New York. Tammany Hall, a name you all will probably understand and recognize as being the center of the democratic political action in New York going back into 1786. It was also the place of large, after large scale Irish immigration of the, of the inclusion of the Irish vote we might think Tammany Hall is the father of that, but we would be missing this guy. Okay, this man is John Hughes, the fourth Archbishop of New York. Uh, we will know him from 1842 to 1864 as being, amongst other things, the man who began the construction of the present St. Patrick's Cathedral. No mean feat in and of himself, but he was somebody who took vociferous anger at the fact that there was Protestant religion being taught in the schools the public schools of New York. And he wanted to be able to see to it that Catholic schools, the Catholic religion was taught, or at least that it would be respected inside the schools. 
And so it was that this man began to become a hated political figure because from the pulpit, he united the Catholic vote and more importantly, the Irish Catholic vote. Now, I'm just, I put up here on the right hand side, you'll see a signature from the most Reverend David Moutique, who's the Bishop of the Ukrainian Apocalypse of Edmonton in Canada. You'll notice he puts a cross in front of his name because bishops will put the cross in front of their names. If you get a letter or an email from me, you'll see a cross behind mine. Sometimes you just put P plus sign. Priests put it behind their names. But John Hughes wrote his with an exaggeratedly long horizontal line. And he began to be known, it looked like a knife, and they called him Dagger John because he signed his name with the cross and John, as bishops would. But he played it up and really enjoyed the idea of people seeing him as threatening. Because what he did was he was able to get bishops and others to be able to bring all of the Catholic vote together to further Catholic agendas. So it was that he was able to get the idea of funding for parochial schools of the Catholic nature. He founded St. John's University, which is now known as Fordham University. So he had his hand in many, many things. Catholics in America, all that being brought together, I wanted to suggest in closing a few books. If you like the little things about Dagger John, there's a wonderful book about him called Dagger John, Archbishop John Hughes and the Making of Irish America. I mentioned already how the Irish saved civilization. About the famine, the great suffering would be the Black Potatoes is an excellent book, a great award winner, the story of the great Irish famine. There's a mention already, the Confessions of St. Patrick. I think that's a worthy one to include if you're interested in doing that as well. And there's also good books about the Irish in America. And if you're interested about the early New York political machines, including both Dagger John, but also uh, Tammany Hall, Plunkett of Tag Tammany Hall is actually a guidebook that was published, much of advice on how to use political finagling to make things happen in a big city. It's a period, current period piece that I think you may find interesting. So that is what I've got for you guys today and my little story about St. Patrick and the Irish. And just to show you that I really do it, that's my signature with my little teeny tiny dagger of my own. And that's what I've got to say. Back to you, Connor. Thanks for that, Father Patrick. That was a fantastic talk. Um, me being Connor Flanagan, fairly Irish myself, uh, you know, sort of a pointed interest uh, for me. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions or anything, please feel free to submit them below. Uh, if you're right here. So I have one from somebody saying, I visited Ireland uh, in 2017 and toured St. Patrick's resting place. The tour guide claimed that St. Patrick was Protestant. How can this be if the Reformation movement occurred centuries later? Well, I'll tell you, it can't be. <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, and, and that's interesting to hear because uh, it's true. The, the, the Protestant Reformation predates even Martin Luther. We want to really look at his early fingers inside the culture. Um, he was willing to adapt more. Um, he is a really good... Uh, missionary, uh, because he is successful by using what he's got there, and he's not so strict. A lot of the Catholic missionaries, especially in the American Southwest, for instance, uh, came in and said, we want you to be little Europeans, and we want you to live like Europeans and have European habits and European clothes and things like that. Patrick, like a lot of other, uh, the Jesuits were very good at this, but Patrick, as we, we described, baptized things so something that may not necessarily have flown in Rome uh, because it wasn't exactly the way the sort of the monolithic church dictated, Patrick was able to accomplish by, um, by doing this in such a way that it, it utilized things around there. So I can see where he might be. He wasn't necessarily a very good Roman Catholic, but I think he was still a pretty good Catholic. Gotcha. Um, and then we have uh, from director of the museum, Tom Edmonds, uh, asking if you're working on a book. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then, uh, no, no, I, I won't do that. Um, <laughs> I actually have, have a dream of writing a book on, um, on U.S. religious history. Uh, I taught for five years in a parochial high school in Louisiana, uh, U.S. religious history. And I'm actually doing a, uh, a series right now uh, during Lent at my church uh, at St. John's. I'm doing a series on Sundays about um, 
the voice of faith in, in, in U.S. Uh, public discourse, sort of a looking at the history and, and what's good and what's bad. And it's something I truly love doing so, but there's already very, very good textbooks on that. So I, I'm, it's difficult for me to think, what is Patrick's voice to, to write that is not already out there? Uh, he also said that uh, he was happy to see you bringing in the uh, aligning ancient Irish symbols with contemporary ones. Um, that was a that was a good surprise, but he he did suspect you would include Lucky Charms. Um, you know, I had to. Uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> Seems obvious. Um, so we have somebody else saying, uh, thank you, Father Patrick. I appreciate the coverage of both secular and sacred history, especially how the separate traditions intertwined. Thank you. Yes. For the Irish, it's almost impossible. This is a funny anecdote. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. So let me just say this. Uh, if you're a good Catholic, you'll know uh, what I mean about the, about the mea culpa, which is, you know, you beat your breast three times in confession to, sin, to confess your sins. You say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, by my fault, by my own fault, by my most grievous fault, Okay. Now, I saw this in National Geographic, and it's very true, because of the Catholic culture of, of Ireland. You know, if you cut somebody off in traffic in America, what do you do? You wave at them? Well, it might look like you're flipping them off. Or you could honk at them, you know, beep, beep, or something like that. They might think that you're beeping back or something like that. But in Ireland, people will sit there and beat their best three times like that. And it tells the other driver that you're saying, yeah, my bad. I shouldn't have cut you off. Sorry. Hmm. Because of the Catholic identity. Uh, yeah, we, we talked prior to the uh, to the lecture starting today about the interesting interwovenness of paganism with Christianity in general. And like you're were, you were saying, with talking about Irish history, it's almost impossible to fully separate those two ideas. It's uh, extremely entwined. Yes. Um, we have a uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, is St. Patrick related to the Irish monk that I have seen associated with discovery of the Americas? Or can you comment on that? Well, you know, I've, I've described a good bit about the Irish being a seagoing people. Um, you know, I was fascinated in my youth. Uh, for those of you who know Thor Heyerdahl and, and the Khan Tiki, that may be too obscure for, for most folks. But there was, a, a, there was an attempt to prove that the ancient Egyptians could have come to America. And they literally made this papyrus boat. Uh, and some, some brave Nordic soul decided to see if he could sail it. And he did. And there were other ones to see, there was other ways, you know, there's there some people that said the Polynesians may have come over. Could we make a large enough outrigger and make it that way? Um, the Irish were folks that could do it. The, the one thing that we can say is there's every reason to believe that many of the European and even the Polynesian peoples um, had the technology to do it. There's a very famous story about a Chinese emissary, one of the eunuchs of the Imperial Court, predating Magellan and, and, and others like that, certainly Christopher Columbus, who came as far as Africa in a massive junk, the ability to travel transatlantic, but they kind of got there and said, nah, <laughs> they went back to China and said, nothing worth it out there. Uh, and so they, they decided to just turn around and go back. The capability of doing that is possible. St. Patrick's probably, given the fact that he was a little older, you know, in, in terms of most people, probably ended his days in Ireland. But there, the idea of the monks, like I described, these white monks, some of them might have actually gotten in larger boats and not just the small coracles and were willing to give it a try to go even deeper. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the Americas, some Irish made it by there. You know, the, the hard part about all of this is, is that, you know, with very little metal to show for it and very infrequent travels of such a long duration, you'd be hard pressed to be able to get good archaeological evidence to support. But, you know, there's, there's been latter attempts using period ships and period uh, materials that could actually make transatlantic and in some cases trans-Pacific uh, travels to the new world. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty commonly agreed upon the most historians today that Columbus was not the first. Um, there was definitely others. But like you said, it's, it's hard to fully prove it because nobody, when they came before, set up permanent settlements and uh, everything sort of was, oh, we're here. Well, I guess we'll leave now. Um, <laughs> It or die. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> it does not make it back, you know. Right. It's a daunting right. task to make it over. Yeah, I think there's evidence of like Vikings coming over. Um, the Polynesians, like you said, that's a that's a very popular one that they they landed somewhere in South America. Um, so yeah, it's very possible. Um, let's see, do you, do you think the famous Irish storytelling gift comes from the non-written past? 
absolutely. Absolutely. I think even now, millennium later, millennia later, we can see inside the Irish this cultural identity. As much as I enjoy um, multiculturalism, the idea of an inclusive and largely traveled and storied nations of, 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 uh, of integration and diversity, there's something to be said for a people that have kept their cultural identity and their, their customs in such a way that you can see the thread of things through there. Judaism is an excellent example of that, you know, that you have stories and sagas and rituals um, and festivals that, that, can, that become ingrained inside people's worldview, their paradigms, not just in their observances. And I think the Irish, are, I mean, that idea of the bard's harp is very true, the, you know, the ability to, to spin a yarn uh, as an old Irish friend once told me that when he said something that was not entirely true in a story, he said that an Irishman never lets the facts get in the way of a good story. You know, it's this idea of being able to enjoy just having a say. And again, like hagiography, does it, does it fail to be truthful if it fails to be factual? And that is at the essence, really kind of just back around again to myth. Uh, and again, as a plug for Joseph Campbell, you know, the idea that myth means falsehood is one of the greatest losses to human society because our myths are actually humanity's inspired arguments and understandings of making sense of the divine and the, and, and the, uh, the mortal in ways that, that fit into our, our experiences. And, you know, their, their commonalities is something that we can't lightly ignore. And I think likewise, you know, the, the ability of the Irish to have that longstanding um, conveyance of, and it, it does something also about the peoples. I say this more from an experience of studying Native Americans, the necessity of a previous generation to convey knowledge when it's only orally and the receptivity to retain, to, to accept that knowledge creates a very tight and cohesive society and one that that is bent upon conveyance and, and communication. Uh, the, the Americans that used to oppress the Native Americans thought that they were lazy because they were, quote, visiting too much. They, they just sat around and talked. But that was how you decided what to do, because without uh, a written repository of information, you would get all the, the knowledge together in a room and talk it up. And eventually, you'd come up with an understanding of what to do. Yeah, so this is what I can blame on me never being able to shut up um, is my my Irish heritage. Good for you. <laughs> I don't have that excuse. I'm just a blabbermouth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you picked the right profession and uh, hobbies, giving lectures and such, being able to talk at will. Um, <laughs> but but I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, uh, specifically, I want to thank you, Father Patrick, for joining us. This was uh, another great talk, a lot of great history awesome. here. A lot of great discussion points. Um, hopefully everybody enjoyed themselves today and we can see you at some of our future programs. Uh, thank you and have a good day. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>